that and to use those. Uh, well, you don't just get a retrovirus that suddenly gets turned into a placenta. I mean, you have mutations that accumulate over time that eventually the end product just happens to be what we call a placenta today. But uh, absolutely mutations can be good things. They aren't always deleterious. Doesn't that make the assumption that, that all placental mammals are only placental generated because of an endogenous retrovirus? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But that entire endogenous retrovirus isn't functional. They just slowly domesticated a protein from an endogenous retrovirus over the course of time. Well, that is what the theory says, that once the viral DNA entered the genome, mm -hmm. then it was, it was domesticated. Now, mm -hmm. that, that sounds authoritative, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a mechanism that's assumed in the word domesticated. Mm -hmm. uh, this, is, this is the theory. This is the assumption that's made. And like I said, I have no problem with making assumptions. But to say that we know that an endogenous retrovirus is the reason there's a third, uh, a third branch of mammals. Well, um, you, if you knock it out, you don't get babies anymore. They did it in sheep, I believe. You don't get babies anymore. So yeah. there's no other pseudogenes that, that, uh, uh, that are there that could there do this? Be, well, it is sufficient. It is necessary and sufficient. Today. But mutations can be good. Is an endogenous retrovirus a mutation? Yeah. Where does it come from outside? Uh, it comes from a virus. It's not something generated within the genome itself. Now, once it's in there, it can, it can mutate, right? Yeah. Oh, OK. So, it so endogenous retroviruses aren't a mutation. They're a change in the original genome. They are genetic material that's borrowed from another organism, true? That isn't normally there. That isn't normally there. Okay, so it's coming. It's coming from another deck of cards. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Have you read the Bible from front cover to end and still believe everything that you believe? Um, when I just this can I can come back for that. Um, but my parents made sure that I did, and I also read uh, various Islamic tales and Buddhist tales, and my favorite when I was little were the Egyptian tales. Um, Hathor, the coolest god ever, just look that up on Wikipedia. Um, but yes, and the, and the but the thing is, I was taught evolution by two theistic evolutionists, and one was a uh, Quaker and one was a Methodist. Um, part of my family is Catholic, and they don't particularly have a problem with evolution. So I don't, I don't like that disconnect. Um, but, well, I mean, he said if he suddenly started believing evolution, he would quit going to church. You don't have to do that, um, unless, I guess, if you go to a church that absolutely demands that the earth is 6,000 years old. Um, but then I think it's just a, it's a personal change and a personal belief. It's like I couldn't... So you think you'll go to heaven when you pass? Um, I don't know if a heaven exists, personally, but I can come back and talk about that later. <laughs> Yeah, let's go back over here. Yeah. <clears throat> My question is directed to the audience here. Uh, if there are any officials with the church, pastors, I'd like to know if there's a discussion group, say a religious education group, uh, that meets periodically and say reads religious texts. And if so, if such a group would be willing to honor this discussion and honor Dr. Jackson in particular, no offense, Abby. But uh, Dr. Jackson twice quoted Richard Feynman, uh, saying that science is a long history of learning how not to fool ourselves. I would highly recommend that everybody read uh, Surely You're Joking, Mr. Feynman, or any of his other books. So I, I challenge the church, challenge members of the church to do just that. So we're going to honor Dr. Jackson and Abby, and uh, that's a great quote. Big fan of Richard Feynman. I'd like to thank you for reminding me of what uh, the wit and wisdom of Feynman and I'm going to go home and dig up some root refinement and read it. <laughs> so thanks for that. Excuse me, Doctor. Uh, do you know much about uh, the uh, God particle that they're talking about now in the Higgs boson? Uh, which we've been trying to find at CERN, and they'll fire it back up again in November. We, we don't know. It's our lust for infinity. Uh, we want to find the smallest to prove there isn't anything smaller. We want to find the farthest with the deep field Hubble telescope.
to, and we would love to find the end of the universe. Uh, it's again this this uh, this un uncomfortableness we have with the concept of infinite. It's I think the same reason that many people are uncomfortable with the idea of of a supreme being of God uh, on a visceral level, uh, not on a. Uh, on a, on a data-driven level is because of the problem with trying to calculate infinity. And the Higgs boson, uh, referred to as the God particle, I, I think kind of kind of shows that quest for the infinitely small, wouldn't you say? And if, if they can produce uh, that one single uh, particle with a super collider, what do you think will happen after that? Well, Stephen Hawking thinks they'll form a lot of little microscopic black holes, but they'll blip right back out of existence too, too quickly for them to suck us all in. And everyone is all worried about that. What do I think will happen? I'm actually not a particle physicist. I find it interesting, as you do. I'm waiting to see what they find out. I think it's delightful research. I taught high school and college chemistry uh, for eight years, and uh, of course I was always just trying to stick with uh, proton, neutron, and electron, and when they asked a little more, we'd go into, you know, quarks and uh, talk about leptons and baryons, and, and then, then of course we talk about things that are make-believe, like gravitons, and we talk about uh, gravitrinos, uh, when we talk about the uh, antimatter version of a make-believe particle, so it's very, very theoretical stuff. That's why they want to get some data on these things, because so much of it is theoretical. It's, it's good stuff, but we're, we're, we're discovering the universe, and uh, contrary to what some people might, might tell you, uh, belief in God, at least for me, I can say, doesn't stifle my scientific curiosity. Um, Isaac Newton is quoted, uh, cited as saying this, but he was really quoting somebody else. All of science is thinking God's thoughts after him. And I'm convinced that honest religionists and honest scientists will come to the same conclusion one day, that there is one truth. Look, 